What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Bitcoin and Markets. My name is Ansel Lindner, and we are on ETF Watch. All day has been kind of slow for news uh, in the Bitcoin world because we have all been waiting for this ETF to drop. So we're going to take a look at the charts. We're going to take a look at some of the tweets. And then the other topic I have lined up today is demographics. And if you guys have been following my content for a while, you know, I think demographics is one of the biggest issues of our time. It will be probably the biggest issue of your children's lives, uh, if not your own. And so uh, I like to cover it as often as possible. And I did put a, a talk that this guy gave. He's the author of a book. I think it's called Empty Planet. And he gave a talk on demographics. So we're going to watch through that. I'll pick out some of the good parts and play that for you guys. And we'll have a discussion. So, okay. Let's dive into the website first. So bitcoinandmarkets.com is the website. I put out a professional tier uh, proton today, Bitcoin Singularity and what's coming up for oil prices. Now, the Singularity is kind of like what I've been talking about with this ETF. We don't know. We It's very hard to see exactly what's going to come on the other side. We're starting to get some glimpses of things like that BlackRock has now apportioned $2 billion to help facilitate the launch. Uh, there's other companies out there. I think Bitwise is like $100 million that they've set aside to launch uh, on the first day. So there, you know, there's a lot of this. Uh, we can kind of see the scale of the liquidity. And I think there's going to be about two to ten billion dollars coming in to Bitcoin ETFs in the first month. Um, that might be ten might be on the high, real high side, but uh, ten billion by probably three months out uh, from the launch, especially with everything coinciding um, with a coming recession and Bitcoin being a recession hedge and the having. So you have the ETF, the recession, and the having. All coming up in the next three months, I think there could be a massive, massive push of value into Bitcoin. Uh, so that's the Bitcoin singularity, and I chart it out and talk about it. Um, and also, I go through oil prices and look at the oil charts and what we can expect. And because I've been talking about peak, sorry, peak oil demand, I keep getting it mixed up now with peak cheap oil. I've talked about that too much, but. Um, peak oil demand. And so I've been calling for lower prices. I said, you know, the, the spike during the Russia, Ukraine in, or the Russia invasion of Ukraine right there at the beginning, uh, that was like a top. And then we've been trending lower ever since pretty much. Uh, so I go through a few charts and then I look back in history and I say, okay, well, what did it look like in 2019? Okay, because I've been talking how close we I think 2024 is going to be like 2019 in regards to uh, Powell cutting in regards to the pre recession trade and slowly going into recession throughout the year. Um, so I looked at how oil performed there and what can we take, you know, how can we apply that to today? What should we expect for oil? So that's that was on the professional tier proton. We also have the January price forecast competition. This is the last day to get your entries in. You can see if you're a paid member on the website, you can come in here and put in your entry and it's all good to go. So, all right, let's, one last thing, one last thing. Let me bring up if I can get to it real quick. Where is it? I'll just type it in here. This is bmpro.substack.com. Put out my most recent one came out uh, three days ago now. Uh, 2023 year in review and 2024 forecast. So you guys can check that out. Appreciate all the likes on that. If you guys are members and you read these, uh, please like it. Give it a heart there. And that helps, you know, tell... The Substack, not only does it t help tell Bitcoin Magazine that people are liking it, but um, also it probably, you know, helps the Substack algorithm, however 
uh, it shares stuff out or recommends things. So, all right. Now, 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 let's go into the ETF news. So this morning, let me make sure that's going out on the right screen. Okay, there we go. It is Eleanor Tourette, and she works, I think she works for uh, Fox Business. Let me see. Yeah, Fox Business. And she had this tweet this morning, new regarding the Bitcoin spot ETFs, expecting some Amendment 9B-4 filings today, as well as some 11th hour phone calls concerning comments on S1s and possible launch dates. So they're already picking out launch dates. Uh, the timeline for approval still looking like next week. Uh, but throughout the day, there was a lot of, you know, people talking about everything's getting lined up, everything's lined up, everything's lined up. And so I thought that there's a possibility that we could have an after hours announcement, um, you know, today at 430, something like that. That's why I put this live stream a little bit later, but that did not happen. So let's continue reading. The timeline for approvals looking like next week, but will all depend on how fast the SEC can read through comments and amendments made today. Okay. Next thing out that I saw, because like I said, it was kind of a slow news day because everybody's just waiting with bated breath. They're either talking about the ETF or they're doing those three green dot and one red dot images <laughs> that American HODL started some new meme. But okay, this is from Robert Malakis, and I heard that this was a parody account, but, you know, whatever. It's out there in the ether now. Uh, breaking news, Gary Gensler resigned for family reasons. I don't think that's going to be the case. Rumors have it that BlackRock Bitcoin ETF is getting approved by the end of the day during an emergency meeting. Okay, well, I mean, I don't know. I had another tweet today. Let me go find my tweet that I put out unpopular opinion people love to hate gary g but he's a bitcoin maximalist at heart and this comes from anthony scaramucci he said uh, gary gensler is a bitcoin maximalist not you know lots of people hate gary gensler i mean obviously he's part of the government bitcoin is bitcoiners tend to be you know more libertarian more anarchist right and they don't like government involvement they don't like government regulation and Gary Gensler kind of is the personification of that. So he's not popular at all. He also knows this technology extremely well. He's a big, big fan of Satoshi. He sings his praises. And he knows for a fact that these altcoins are, are unregistered securities, that they're scams. And so the crypto bros don't like him either. They don't really care too much about the anarchist side, like that they hate regulators in general the crypto bros hate people that are anti-crypto that call out their scams so they don't like gary gensler so yeah he's very unpopular but like i said recently he is probably the best sec chairman we could have hoped for no way jay clayton would have approved this there, there's Gary Gensler has balanced, I think, the pressure from the globalist administration and the pressure from Wall Street. And he knows this technology extremely well. So he knows like what's going on, what's the underlying kind of drama in Bitcoin and underlying drama, Bitcoin versus crypto and all of that. So, yeah, I think he was the best commissioner at this time. Now, if we go back to that last tweet then. Oh, I'm on the wrong tab. Sorry, dudes. Jeez, Louise. Okay, let me go back to this tweet. I just ranted there. So breaking news, Gary Gensler resigns for family reasons, blah, blah, blah. And then I showed my tweet was uh, this unpopular opinion. People love to hate Gary G, but he is a Bitcoin maximalist at heart. Okay. And I just went through and described that. So if we're back on this one now, maybe Gary Gensler took the job to do this exact thing. And that might sound a little bit um, far-fetched or conspiratorial, but he was, his life for the last five years before he became SEC chairman was teaching about blockchain, teaching about Bitcoin, 
loving on Satoshi. Then he comes in. It's almost like he it, it, it's possible that he was handpicked to get this done. He was handpicked by the big, powerful people on Wall Street that, that saw this pivot coming, that knew this was going to come, and they picked out Gary Gensler to get this job done. I mean, that's it's out of left field theory, but it's possible. Get a Bitcoin spot ETF rammed through against the wishes of the globalists, against the wishes of the Elizabeth Warrens and the Joe Bidens and administration and the, the EU and the ECB. Ram that thing through. Get it done, Gary G. So being that that's a minor possibility that that's happened. Now, when I read this, family reasons, maybe he's got the job done and he's out. I don't know, but we'll have to see if there's any, I mean, this doesn't look like it's probably real, but those are the type of things that run through my mind (laughs) when we look at this. Okay. Let's go to the next tweet. And this is by Walter Bloomberg and Walter working at Bloomberg. And he says, SEC commission vote on exchange rule filings expected next week. So again, they could, I mean, how painful would it be for the Bitcoin news cycle if they didn't do anything till Wednesday next week? That would be like five days of dead air in this space where everyone is just waiting and waiting for this to happen. Of course, we'll probably have more and more leaks coming out, more people talking about uh, this ETF issuer is, you know, has already set aside 500 million, a billion dollars for launch, et cetera. So th- that's the kind of news that we could expect if this goes out till Wednesday. Okay, Bitcoin ETF applicants, clear key hurdle on path to SEC sign off. Also, this exchange rule, so that's the 19B-4. They're trying to change the rules or ask permission to change the rules to list these things. Then there's the S1, the way I understand it. That's like the financial stuff. That's the plumbing of the product. So then if we go back to Eleanor, see, she's talking about the phone calls concerning comments on S1s and possible launch dates. So they're trying to, to squeeze all this in, the rule change and the, the financial plumbing of the products so that they can announce this and probably have launch dates. And it has been pretty quick. Remember, it was just back on December 29th that they're like, that's our deadline to get any updates on your 19Bs in. Now people are, now they're trying to get their S1s all worked out so that they can be in this first group to launch. It, I, my, I'm at at 95% that this, this thing is going through. All right. So let's take a look at the chart then. With all that being said, let's go take a look at the chart. So this is what I'm watching here. Uh, This is the hourly chart. We have this descending um, trend line and would look like we're just breaking up here. We have this dashed trend line that is below this formation from the 2nd of January, tagged up there, kind of sold off, and now we're breaking up to test it again. Uh, So we'll see how that rolls. Also on the Proton that I put out this morning, you know, I have my Bitcoin forecast on there. So short term, medium term, and long term. Um, My medium term forecast was going up. So all pretty much most of the last year, my medium term forecast was going up th- through uh, the ETF stuff. Now it's starting to include the halving. So that's my medium term. And I gave so I, I threw out some targets for that for out to the halving. And I think it's going to surprise a lot of people because we have those three things coinciding. We have the uh, ETFs, which is going to create a supply crunch. Billions of dollars buying Bitcoin with a multiplier too, don't forget. So, you know, two to 10 billion or so coming in the first month, huge supply crunch on Bitcoin. Then we're going to have end of Q1 
possible banking crisis again. You know, we had 2020, we had obviously the COVID crash. Then in uh, last year, in 2023, we had Signature Bank and uh, Silicon Valley Bank at the end of Q1. Uh, and going into recession, it's possible or maybe even likely that we have some sort of end of Q1 banking issue again. What happened to Bitcoin back in March? Right there. That happened. 40% rally during the banking crisis. So again, ETF supply crunch, banking crisis, kind of bank run into safe havens, which Bitcoin is one. And the last thing is the having, the having hype, the having cycle. So I think the this first quarter is going to, all the way out to having, is going to be very surprising to a lot of people. I think there's a chance that we see some monster, monster candles. But okay, that is Bitcoin. Let's take a look at some other notable things. Again, I wrote about oil here. Oil, not able to really do much. Sticking at $73 per barrel. We got the 10-year coming in on a little bit of a, a jump, getting into some resistance. Now, I did talk about this on BM Pro. So let me bring up another chart. So this was, I think I initially wrote that piece that came out on the 2nd. I wrote it like back on the 29th or something. And I was talking about this right here uh, that probably coming into a bottom for several reasons. You know, the RSI was down low. We had a crossover on the MACD and it just looked like it was ready to turn direction. Everybody is buying into this. Um, that everyone realized rates, uh, these rates were falling. And, you know, that's how it usually goes is once everyone sees it and realizes, oh my gosh, the rates have come down from 5% down to 3.75% uh, in just a couple months, that's when you're going to bottom, you know? It, it's already, the move is already late. So that's why I drew this kind of path talking about, okay, we'll probably rally and people will say, oh, the Fed's going to raise again. Inflation is going to uh, uh, reaccelerate and yada, 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 right? All, all of the doomsday stuff again, but then it turns over and those people get caught on the wrong side of the narrative once again, and we fall down further by March because we have that end of Q1 kind of pinch point here for uh, the financial system. Now, why do why is there that pinch point for people kind of new to my, my stuff? The reason why we have pinch points at the end of quarters is uh, first off in banking, they have loans are very cyclical. And, you know, if you look at home loans, home loans, they they uh, ramp up through the year. You know, from the first of the year, they ramp up and they kind of peak just before the end of Q3. They peak in like August, September time. And so most of that banking business that they're doing with home loans is being finished up at that time. There's also uh, fiscal year concerns. Um the government's fiscal year ends in the end of Q3. End of quarters typically are picked by companies to end their fiscal years at the end of quarters. Most, I think most businesses do their fiscal years at the end, of, like calendar year, but some of them might do Q1, Q2, Q3. Then you also have the agricultural cycle. A lot of the futures and a lot of options and lots of that stuff is getting settled up. A lot of people are defaulting. A lot of people are paying back paying back their loans, um, it, you know, in the farm, in the agricultural space. So uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes into why their seasonality and why Q3 and Q1 specifically are pinch points for the financial system. But anyway, I've talked about that. I wrote up a whole piece on that. Um, what other charts can we look at? How about the dollar? We're making a recovery here. 
long leg, long legged doji today. Uh, we will see where that goes. Gold kind of unchanged, kind of wavering here, not doing much. Why is this on? So that's that. And back to Bitcoin. All right. So we are waiting. We are waiting. The whole space is waiting for this ETF to come through. Uh, looks like it is very, very high probability at this point. Um, I've been around since the first ETF denial. And so earlier this week, I was starting to get a little anxious. My doubt was starting to creep in. Uh, but I think it looks all systems go for this ETF. And what happens after that? I mean, could be lights out. Could be very surprising to a lot of people. Okay, uh, let's go on to the next topic for today. And that is going to be this video on demographics. Now, I already got some pushback in the Telegram. <laughs> I, I get it. So I, I said, Hey guys, what should I talk about today? I'm thinking about talking about demographics and I'm going to say his name wrong. Danis gold. It's from, it's a character from Atlas shrug, but, um, I don't know how to pronounce it. Anyway, they said that it's depressing to talk about, we can't change it. So let's, let's not talk about it, but I think it's a very important topic and could be defining of, um, our lives, our children's lives. And we need to know how to address it. We need to know how to position ourselves uh, to take advantage of this. You know, if there, there's a meme in Bitcoin about hodling, right? And being 100% invested in Bitcoin. Well, what happens if Bitcoin goes to a million and then most of the upside for Bitcoin is now gone? I mean, yes, it could 10x again but it's not going to hundred X from a million, most likely, <laughs> most likely. Um, so at that point, it makes sense to diversify, right? And if we, how are we going to do that? I've talked about that we can diversify into Bitcoin related companies. I think that's a very, very good choice because a lot of the Cantillion effect from price increases in, in Bitcoin specifically is going to go into Bitcoin related companies, companies that Bitcoiners like probably go into the tourism industry in El Salvador, stuff like that, right? And so um, we can start thinking about that. Also with demographics, you know, if we know that South Korea is not going to exist in 50, 75 years, then we can make sure that we short that or not invest that or uh, not get put ourselves in a position where that is going to be uh, really impactful in our lives. Same with Japan, same with China. We have to know about this so we're not blind in the world and we can make rational decisions for ourselves and our families. Okay, but let's get into this. This is uh, Vail Symposium. I think they're kind of a little bit like globalist WEF types, but nothing like that came up in this. This is all strictly about demographics. So we are going to go into this. It is Dr. Daryl Bricker and... I think we got everything queued up here. Make sure. Okay. Thanks for having me on, Claire. I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to speak to everybody tonight. So what we're going to talk about tonight, as uh, Claire mentioned, is a book that I wrote with uh, a colleague of mine, actually a very uh, important journalist here in Canada named John Ibbotson. And uh, what the title of the book is, is Empty Planet, uh, The Shock of Global Population Decline, which seems to be a bit counterintuitive, uh, given most of what we hear about what's happening to the global population. Uh, but um, for some reason, this is... Okay, we're going to skip ahead because that first part we all know already. That Ehrlich guy from the 70s, you know, he said, oh, we're going to have us population bomb and we're not going to be, we're going to outstrip the planet. We're going to outstrip our agriculture. There's going to be mass famines and all this stuff, just fear mongering. And of course that was wrong, completely wrong. It's actually the opposite. Now we're going mathematically, just like people can say, we mathematically can't pay off the debt. We mathematically are going to go into a population collapse. 
That's why you have people like Elon Musk that calls it a population collapse. It's mathematically programmed in. I think he says this in here, but uh, one of the statistics that just was like, wow, was um, out of 100 South Koreans, there's only going to be 33 kids. Out of 100 South Koreans, there's only going to be 10 grandchildren. Absolute collapse of the population. And that's, I mean, we don't know that for sure, but the way things are going, it's going to, like, if for a, per, a fertility rate to rise, that person has is 20 years. Those kids aren't being born to have more kids in the future. So even if you um, have a generation that has really low fertility and the next generation has really high fertility, it doesn't matter. There's still this huge collapse of population that's coming. That 20-year reverse bubble, just like the baby boomers are a bubble higher, there would be a bigger bubble lower. So this is already mathematically in that we are going to have a population collapse. Okay, let's let him go. What I'm going to speak to you about tonight uh, is uh, a, a science called demographics, which is really the, the study of people and, uh, and how population uh, changes um, and what's going on in the, in, in the population. So what I'm going to be showing you are, uh, are some numbers. I promise try not to make them boring and keep them really relevant, but you'll really understand why I've come to this conclusion in, in Empty Planet about where the population is headed. Uh, and uh, you'll see what the scenarios look like. So why are demographics? Well, ultimately they're about people and we're getting really good at measuring what's going on with people and populations. And everything that uh, we deal with in terms of demographics is not necessarily what's happening at this moment, but a lot of the effects that we're seeing today are really the product of decisions that people made previously. So the, 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 the decisions that your parents made and your grandparents made about the structure of the population and ultimately really what it's about is the type of family that they wanted to have, the size of the family they wanted to have. As a result of the fact that these decisions were made previously, they're projectable and the outcome from those decisions is projectable. They are facts. We can disagree about the speed and levels of some of these things are gonna happen. You're gonna hear me um, be somewhat critical of the UN's uh, uh, analysis of, uh, of population patterns and, and projections into the future. But even the UN comes to the conclusion that at some point the world's population is going to start to decline. Uh, my argument uh, in the book is that uh, it's going to happen a lot faster. It's going to peak at a lower level uh, and, uh, and it's going to happen sooner than what the UN is suggesting. Okay. I have a blog post. Let's see if I can find it real quick here for you guys. Why should we care about the demographic collapse? And in here I go through, like a lot of people say, oh, you know, that it's okay if we have fewer people. Uh, we'll just have more robots do things. But robots don't consume. Okay? You also need people to make the robots. Um, I go through all of the different reasons in here. Uh, the main thing that I think helps people understand this is a reverse network effect. So, you know, like as people, as a, an economy becomes more, uh, become bigger, more specialized, you know, there's more division of labor. Well, you have to have more people to continue that division of labor, that specialization. If you start having fewer people, you're going to have fewer specializations. You're going to start unwinding the complexity of the market and making it simpler. And that is a reverse network effect. So if you think about for, you know, like uh, Metcalf's law that every person that joins a network benefits everybody. So it's an exponential increase in value to the network for each new additional person. Well, that happens in reverse too. As you start going down, the effects start piling on each other and you have a reverse network effect, simplifying the economy, unspecializing the economy, and it can rapidly decay. Uh, one of the things is like infrastructure, okay? 
uh, and somebody in the Telegram had a great comment on this, is that infrastructure itself is a, the end result of a highly, highly complex economy. You have to have people trained. You have to have machinery to build it. You have to have uh, transportation systems and logistics to get raw materials from X to Y. And all of that, if you start losing specialties, it's going to become harder and harder or more expensive and slower to fix infrastructure. So you start having an unraveling of the economy and the benefit is not even there. Like right now, if you say you wanted to fix a bridge in the United States, you could say, okay, well, this bridge, there's... Um, 95 million cars go over this bridge every year. It's a vital, vital uh, line for our economy. And we need to we need to make sure it doesn't go out of commission. All right. Well, if the population is half, maybe the traffic will be affected by even more than half. So it might be only 30 million cars go over that bridge in a year. And so then you're like, okay, well, is it now is that bridge really important is it is it worth fixing for a billion dollars or do we just let it corrode and then fall so these these are the decisions that we're going to have to make not and those are the economic things that don't involve stuff like paying for elderly so it it gets scary very quickly okay let's go back to the Video. demographics are like glaciers i wanted to say wildfire that's usually the way that we talk about these things are like a, a tsunami um, and uh, it's going to change everything that's in front of it but the thing that's really interesting about glaciers is as they move through the land they also change everything under them and around them uh, when the glacier recedes the world, the the uh, the earth that it's traveled over has changed forever. So where while a wildfire can have you know a temporary effect and 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 maybe change things for for a period of time, things tend to grow back as they were. That's not the same with glaciers. And demographics are like glaciers; they change everything. The big demographic trends change everything, and they're very difficult to stop once they get started. The other thing is that you can see them coming from an awful long uh, distance away. Whether they're receding or they're coming towards you, you can you can spot it uh, from a fairly uh, long distance. And I think the trends that we're going to be talking about tonight, or I'm going to be talking about tonight, are some of those glacier-like uh, uh, trends that you can see them coming. They're going to change everything forever, uh, and we're going to be living with them for a very long time. But every once in a while, something can happen like COVID-19, which is a wildfire, as I described it before. Um, and what happens when a wildfire meets a glacier? Well, in the short term, the we're going to skip ahead. So let me describe the population bust for you. These are the UN's projections about what the global population is going to look like between now and 2100. The big dark red line in the center is what they call their median variant. So if all of their estimations about uh, what the population is going to do in terms of uh, uh, fertility rates, Mobility, amount of mobility that's taking place and mortality rates is as they predict, we're going to end up with a, a population of about 11 billion people. If the top blue line happens, you see it's plus 0 0.5. That means that we have half a kid more in terms of fertility on average around the world than the UN projected. Our population is gonna spring above 16 billion people. If we have though, just half a kid less than the UN is projecting, the population is gonna end up, up, up approximately around where it is today and probably even lower. Uh, this estimate looks like about 7.2 billion people. So it's a pretty wide distribution that the UN has in terms of uh, the, uh, the variance of population expansion that it, it, uh, it sees going forward. But the one that it puts most of its emphasis on is that line in the middle that gets to 11 billion people. I'm going to argue in and he doesn't touch on this, but this is not the population. This is a global population, not the population of per, the productive part of the world. So, yes, Africa is going to continue to have more 
children. They're on the same path. They're only about 50 years behind the rest of the world. But the productive, the places where people can be most productive, those are the places that are going to unravel. So global GDP, you know, the, the highest GDP countries, that's where this is going to unravel first. And what's going to happen to the rest of the world? It's going to unravel too. So it doesn't really matter if this is going up. Like I would love to see a G7 chart. Like let's look at a G7 population out to 2100. Or maybe even I would say G20. Let's do G20 out to 2100. It would be drastically lower than it is today. Maybe half. Probably I would say a minimum of 75%. So 25% down, a quarter fewer people in the G20 countries by 2100. In this uh, in this presentation, that's just simply not going to happen. And the reason for that is because things are not happening equally everywhere. Uh, those two big blue circles that are staring at you from the charts, uh, from this chart, are the two largest countries in the world, India and China. They constitute 37% of the global population. Every other country in the world is distributed here in a little circle based on the size of the population that it has relative to the rest of the world. So the top 10 are countries like the United States, which by the way is number three, Nigeria, Indonesia, Russia, you can see some other countries that are displayed there. But the two big countries, China and India, if it's, if it's not happening there, it almost doesn't matter what's happening anywhere else. These are the top 10 countries in the world in terms of where they are relative to population today or in 2017 and where the most recent projections and these ones come from the University of Washington um, and were uh, published in the Lancet magazine. Uh, Let's go to the next section. So what's happening in terms of urbanization? The biggest migration in the world today is not people moving from one country to another country. It's people moving from the countryside to the city. Back in 1960, about a third of the globe's population lived in a city. Today, it's 57%. The UN tells us that by 2050, it'll be 68%. And this is happening everywhere. Africa, Asia, Europe, happening less in places like North America because we already were a pretty urbanized um, a population along with the European population, but the developing world is, is urbanizing incredibly fast. And that has a major impact on fertility rates because when you move from the country to the city, your economic calculation about children in your lives changes. On the farm, they're extra hands. In the city, they're more of an expense. So you tend to have smaller families. That- There's a lot of back and forth on this, this particular topic of urbanization. Um, It's gone back and forth over the decades. Uh, Demographics, a lot of the earliest stuff was from about 100 years ago. And urbanization was pretty much the first thing that people keyed in on was causing this. Then there was some um, back and forth where uh, some studies started showing that there wasn't actually a tight correlation between fertility and urbanization. Uh, That happened like in the 80s. So then a couple decades were wasted by not believing that and now we're back into it where uh, people are thinking that urbanization is one of the biggest drivers for the drop in fertility Uh, but there's a lot that goes into that right Uh, you would think that uh, well first off infant mortality goes down drastically when you are closer to medical care so cities can be just thought of as being closer to services, medical services. So your your infant mortality rate goes way down. And when that happens, that coincides with a drop in fertility. So you have, you know, in the past, maybe they had six kids or seven kids, half of them died before the age of five. Now they have two kids or three kids and all of them are surviving. So uh, the infant mortality rate or urban the effect of urbanization there's a lot that goes into specifically what that is it's not just about culture it's not just about uh the um like p- 
progressive nature that we see in cities. But yeah, okay. That's not the only reason we'll get into some of the other reasons that, that, uh, that we're seeing declining fertility. But urbanization is a big, a big factor. And for the 10 most populous countries, take a look at China at the top. It's gone from 16% urban population in, in uh, 1960 to today, where those numbers have flipped. It's now 61%. A tremendous wow. amount of change in a very short period of time. By 2050, the UN tells us uh, the, uh, uh, the population of China is going to be 80% urban. But if you take a look at all of these countries, including the developing countries, you're seeing a really rapid pace of urbanization. Japan, by the way, which loses, a which loses about half a million people a year from its population, by 2050 is going to be 95% urban. Today, it's 92%. Uh, they're now putting um, mannequins in bus stations in Japan uh, for the people who are left in rural communities so they don't feel lonely. You can look that up on, uh, on the internet. Go take a look because rural Japan is just about empty. So as I said before, the major effect is on fertility of urbanization. So the magic number to keep in mind is 2.1. That's the number of children a woman needs to have in her lifetime in order to offset the number of people who are gonna be dying population. So you have to have that number 2.1 every year in your population on average, in terms of fertility rate, in order to just replace the number of people who are gonna be dying. 2021, the United States registered its lowest fertility rate in a century at 1.6. And by the way, United States has high levels of fertility compared to most of the developed world. So I'm going to spend a couple seconds on this because it really is the key to what we talked about in Empty Planet. So back in 1960, the average woman in the world had 5.2 children during her lifetime. Can Today, that number is 2.4. The UN tells us it's going to be 2.2 by 2050. The 2.3 number in red is the number that that Lancet study that I said came out in August um, has for global fertility, which is already lower than uh, what uh, the UN has in its projections that get us to 11 billion people. Yeah, and every time some other demographics come out, whether it's from China or from South Korea or you know anywhere, there are, are always misses to the downside. So fertility is falling faster than predicted. It's, it's a crazy thing. There is no way that we know of <laughs> is how to stop it besides turning our societies upside down, you know? China, the fertility rate has gone from 5.8 to 1.6, the UN tells us today. The Lancet study tells us it's at 1.5. Yesterday, the government of China released its fertility rate for 2021, and it was at 1.16. So dramatically different from either the optimistic model that the, uh, the UN has or the more pessimistic model that even the Lancet has. India has gone from five. China has another problem too because of the one child policy. They have a huge off, you know, uh, uh, imbalance in men, or they have a, you know, a ton more men. It's something like, I don't know, five, 10 million more men of uh, reproduction age or whatever, uh, marriage age, than they do women. So the fertility rate is actually. And they wouldn't need a 2.1. They would actually need like a 2.2 or 2.3 to just break even because they have this excess number of men. 5.9 to 2.3. The Lancet study says it's actually at 2.1. The Indian government in January, actually just a couple of weeks ago, released its most recent census. It already has fertility rates in India at 2.0. As I mentioned to you before, Jeez. if those two countries representing 37% of the globe, globe's population aren't having kids, it almost doesn't matter what's happening in other place. The US, the UN has at 1.9, Lancet had at 1.8. I just showed you what uh, 
the US Census Bureau has for the fertility rate for 2021, it's 1.6. I expect we're gonna see a very similar story in all of these other countries. By the way, Russia, just to give you a, an interesting uh, um, a population statistic there, by the way, their fertility rates nowhere near 1.6, it's probably down around 1.4. Uh, 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 President Putin has come out and said that the uh, uh, Russian population is shrinking by a million people. Are there the uh, number of deaths in Russia outnumbers the number of births now by over a million people every year. And you can see the uh, usually what's held up as the poster child for low fertility and declining population is Japan. It's at 1.3. China is now at 1.16. So that's why South Korea is at, know, the conclusion that we're not going South to Korea is at 0 0.8. You get to 11 billion people uh, by the end of the century. Uh, you, you can make a you can make an estimation like that because the numbers are just not adding up. If you're not having people, you're not having kids being born in the world, then the likelihood that the population is going to grow really declines. And as I said before, um, it's it's happening everywhere. So why is fertility declining? Number one reason urbanization, I explained it to you, but not only because- But he didn't really explain it. I mean, that, that he's just talking about correlate, correlations there. Uh, I, I was more specific and said, you know, it's probably access to medical care. It's probably lower infant mortality, along with cultural things that are like um, female education. Well, I mean, you know, just think about you have more access to libraries when you are in the city versus living in the country, right? So yeah, female education, access to education, uh, female careers, uh, that has a lot to do with urbanization. Um, of course, that's partly a cultural thing too. You have uh, medical care also includes contraception, access to contraception. So there's all sorts of things about urbanization that go into this. The economic reasons, but also because of the effect that it has on the lives of women. Uh, if there's anything uh, that is the message that comes out of the book, Empty, Empty Planet, it's about the empowerment of women. When women are able to take control over their reproduction, they decide that they want, they generally decide to have fewer children. So they move from the country to the city. They're and that's actually backwards in a lot of the um, research that I've done for my demographics posts that I, blog posts I've been doing, is that, uh, it doesn't make sense to say, oh, once you have access to contraception, then your your demand for children goes down. No, the demand for children goes down first. So moving to the city, getting education, having a career, the demand for children takes a back seat. So the demand for children comes first, contraception comes second. It's a, it's a result. Uh, it is not a cause. They all of a sudden get exposed to education and as a result they take advantage of it and that's why for example uh, uh, women are in, in in most developed countries now represent the majority of of uh, university students in in uh, in uh, post-secondary education in many countries uh, and also when they decide that they want to uh, uh, avail themselves of education what happens is they they delay uh, the process of family formation so if they're getting married at all but getting married in their late 20s. Well, if you take a look back to 1960 um, and take a look at maybe what their mothers or grandmothers were doing, those same women were getting married around the age of, of 21 or 22. Now they're getting married in their late 20s. And when they do start to have their family, they don't start their family at 21, 22. They started at 31, 32. And when they have kids, they don't have four or three and a half like they used to in the United States back in 1960. They're having 1.6. Um, th that's, I don't think that's correct either because <laughs> I mean, who am I? This is guy, this is some Dr. Beryl, Daryl Bricker, but, um, no, the, if, if you wait till 30, over half people never have children, uh, birth gap, that movie showed that it wasn't that there is. It's not that women are having fewer children. It's that fewer women are becoming mothers. They delay, 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 and get to a point where they can't find a suitable husband because women are attracted to higher status. Well, if there's more women graduating from university, you're decreasing your amount of eligible men. 
that you will find attractive. So they get to it to be 28, 29, 30, and they just can't find a guy that meets their standards anymore. And so they don't end up having children. So it's not that people over 30 have 1.6. It's that most women over 30 have zero. The other thing is we're no longer valuing large families the way that we used to. The, the real emphasis is on small families. Uh, just like in India, as they say, you know, uh, we to our two. Uh, and and that's, that's what's happening in cultures all over the world. Uh, smaller families are, are being valued to a higher extent. But there's been a lot of success of government and NGO programs in terms of assisting women with the ability to control the reproduction. And as a result of that, what's happening is they are having fewer kids. And the gender and age structure of the population is changing. Uh, the world as, as the uh, um, population declines and ages is actually becoming more female. The United States, by the way, has more women at the, than men and has for quite a long time. Many, many other countries, for example, Canada, uh, that's just been a fairly recent phenomena, but uh, they're becoming more female. But the population itself is just becoming older. And as it becomes older, it becomes less capable of being able to reproduce itself. And then, as I said before, COVID-19, the babies not born during COVID-19 are not going to be replaced. They're just going to be removed from the population. The estimate in the United States is about 300,000. And that was just in 2021. Aging. It may be a poet, as we say in the book, who observes that for the first time in history of our race, humanity feels old. So life expectancy is increasing everywhere. Back in 1960, the average human being lived to the age of 51. They now live to the age of 73. And by 2050, they'll live to the age of 77. In North America, we're living to the age of 81. In Europe, to 79. Even in Africa, people are now living to the age of 64. There's been a tremendous fast forward says that somebody can die prematurely in the dark color are all the ones that are more likely if you're a man in yellow are the ones that are more likely if you're a woman. Okay. So what he's saying in this section, we'll kind of fast forward through this is that, uh, you know, as we get older, we have, it gets more lopsided towards more women. And I don't think that really matters all that much. Um, because men die of all of these other things first, you know, they have a shorter life expectancy. So, the older, and you can see this on the, the pyramids, the, the demographic pyramids uh, in the beginning and the young cohorts, you have more male babies born, but then by the time you get to the top of the pyramid, it's shifted over to more females in their older age. Uh, but that's not as important, I think. Um, let's see what this next section is. So where to from here? We will grow fewer, which means that there's going to be a global population bust. We're going to reach somewhere between eight and nine billion. I don't know exactly what the number is going to be. It's, uh, somewhere between 2050 and 2060, and then we're going to start the decline. And we I don't like that framing. Okay, global population bust. Yes, that's true. We might reach eight to nine billion. That's true but that doesn't matter. Okay. It's already shrinking in the G20 countries, you know? Um, and people might think this is uh, elitist of me or something, but you know, a, a person born in America or in Germany say is much more productive for the world than a person that's born in, you know, somewhere in Africa. And that's not saying anything about the African people, because you take those same Africans, you put them in, in America, or you put them in Germany, and they're going to be more productive too. It's just about the place you are, you are at, the environment that you are in. And the environment that you are in, when you are in Germany, is more productive. Or Switzerland, or France, or the UK, or the US, whatever. Japan, nowadays in China, uh, urban China. So you're more productive in these, these larger economies. Every individual matters way more. Not, not value of the life, but matters for GDP. Has a bigger impact on GDP than other places that are still growing. So saying that we're going to continue to grow to 9 billion does not show the reality of it. 
we're not going to continue growing. We're pretty much dead in the water right now for the G20 countries. We will end the century with population size like it is today or somewhat smaller. Now, these numbers could be off given the acceleration that we're seeing in terms of uh, declining fertility. So it could, the peak could be lower, it could happen faster, and the decline could be more precipitous. As we say in the book, it's not good, it's not bad, but it's important. The growth in our population today in most countries is a product of population aging. In other words, people not dying as fast as they used to, but also from immigration. Without immigration, the United States and places like Canada, uh, their population would not- Immigration does not affect global population. Actually, immigration, let me take that back. Glo immigration does affect global population because the immigrants will quickly adapt to the native fertility rate. So say that a Guatemalan comes up to the United States. Now in Guatemala, the fertility rate might be three or four still. But that Guatemalan in the US might have one or two. So you affect the total global population by having immigrants. It actually speeds up the decline by allowing, you know, having immigrants move back and forth. Not be growing today at the rate that it's growing. We're going to see a dramatic shift in population structure. We're going to be older with diminishing fertility in smaller families. By the way, in both Canada and the United States today, the most common household is a person living by themselves at the start of their adult life and at the end of their adult life. I think we have to start paying a lot more attention to the power of older women. Why? They're very community engaged. There's a lot of them. They vote. And they're going to have a lot of economic and political power going forward. Somebody's going to figure that out at some point. The world is becoming metropolitan. The human species is becoming metropolitan. And the countryside is emptying out. We're going to see the decline of China. We're going to see the rise of India. And we're especially going to see the rise of Africa. The only part of the world that still has surplus population and still has much higher than average birth rates. But the truth is, even in places like Africa, fertility is declining. The question is just how fast. All of this. Okay. So, you know, like in the GFC was a global financial crisis and everything is connected. Like if we have a downturn in Japan or a downturn in China, it spills over to the rest of the world, right? Well, what do you, he says, a rise of China and a rise of Africa. What does he think when GDP of China is cut in half? The GDP of Japan is cut in half over the next 50 to 100 years. Populations collapse in the rich countries. You think there's going to be a rise of Africa and a rise of India? No. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't like that framing. And also, uh, he talked about old old women and how they're going to have all the money, then we need to pander to them for votes, you know, uh, not maybe not pander to them, but they're going to be a big voting block. Um, and also, like, goods and services should be produced more for the elderly women specifically. But elderly women don't spend a lot of money, okay? Uh, he, he said in one part of this, I, I think I skipped over it, was that how come restaurants are the clientele is getting older, but it seems like they are all made for 20 somethings going out to the bar and drinking, you know, having dinner and a few drinks because old folks don't go out nearly as much. <laughs> so I, I do think that they will have some, obviously some savings, the old folks, but they won't be spending it most likely. Um, in addition there's not going to be as much help from the current workers to pay for, you know, healthcare services, retirement, uh, retirement funds and stuff for these older folks. So they're not going to get as much help from social security. They're not going to get as much help from the government. They're not all this stuff. So they're going to have to save more. They're going their their spending will be curtailed even more 
because they have higher bills because there's not enough young people to pay the taxes to keep them, uh, you know, keep the funds rolling. So th there's a lot of problems with that about old women being the drivers of a lot of the consumption in the future. But okay, that's um, all I'm going to do for this. I, I also wanted to touch on one thing. He didn't really talk a lot about the reverse network effects or the um, price for society in general. But that's my big thing is that we're going to see a reverse in the division of labor, a reverse in the amount of specialization in the world. And a change to the calculus of infrastructure and they're like, just look at Detroit. Okay. Detroit peaked out over 2 million people, I think in like 1960 and it started going downhill and it didn't stop going downhill until like 2010 at 700,000 people. So it lost over half of its people in a very quick amount of time, a little bit quicker, probably than um, we will see you know, demographics around the world now, but for South Korea, no, that's about how quick it will happen. Okay. The fall of Detroit is going to be the fall of Seoul. Imagine that. But what happened there? You couldn't pay for policing. You couldn't pay for fire departments. You couldn't pay for basic services for the people. Like the street lights, none of them worked. Then in, uh, one of the big revitalization projects um, in the early 2000s was to replace all the streetlights because none of them worked. And that took them like two years. So this is, that's the type of stuff we got to think about, worry about. Now, can Bitcoin save us from this? That is the big question. Um, we talked about this a little bit in our Telegram of course, we don't know. There is just too many variables to consider everything. Um, but Bitcoin is being a fixed supply money. Uh, it will, well, it will not allow the government to print as much money, right? You can, you can save in Bitcoin. You can shelter yourself from any of the ill effects that come from the demographic collapse. You know, if there's not enough young people to tax, then uh, they're going to have to just print money for real this time. <laughs> uh, print money for real. And Bitcoin allows you to save uh, and to protect yourself from that. So there are some great things that Bitcoin offers, but Bitcoin is not a solution to the demographic problem. Um, and... Yeah, maybe we'll have to dive into that more in a specific live stream about how Bitcoin can benefit people during the demographic collapse. But okay, BitcoinMarkets.com, check it out. Thanks for hanging out, guys. This is a little bit different episode. Before we bounce out, let me just share the price chart again and check the comments here. Dex Invictus, what's up, buddy? 15-minute cities, bullish for CVS. <laughs> uh, yeah. But the supply chains are break, going to break down, man. So uh, when you go into, especially like a Walmart or something, you see all of these different products on the, the shelves. We're not going to see that. I, I'm pretty much, I, I've resigned myself to saying that we are not going to have half as many SKUs as we have today in our lives. So I don't know how many SKUs Walmart has. Let me Google that real quick. SKUs are just, you know, the product number. Um, how many SKUs does Walmart have? Uh, that's even a question that popped up to complete. Um, each individual Walmart store keeps about 140,000 SKUs on a given day. From fruit to hand soap to electronics. Since many of these goods are bought and offered in bulk, they are normally sold at prices lower than those of competing retailers. Okay, so uh, online, Walmart carries as many as 400 million SKUs. So 
I guess just think of it that way. You know, the future is going to be half as many SKUs in our life. And how is that going to affect our consumption? How is that going to affect um, our economy? You know, there's fewer people doing fewer things. There's fewer people doing fewer specialties, building less things. And robots won't help because robots don't consume. And you need somebody to fix the robots. All right. So that's it. Let me check Telegram, see if there's any comments in there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just laughing because uh, somebody said, oh, there's, well, I'm thinking that they meant about, you know, testosterone and lower sperm counts, that there's not enough sperm to fix the problem. And uh, <laughs> then the other guys in there say, no, there's plenty. Um, we might be called to save the world. That's true. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. Uh, Spag says, how much will Bill's mass sterilization affect Africa? I guess you're talking about Bill Gates. Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting too. They didn't, they didn't take uptake the shots very much, did they? Uh, for COVID because they have a high percentage of people taking hydroxychloroquine, right? But, hmm, yeah, I, I just, I'm not bullish on Africa because if you take out all of the developed countries and you cut them in half and you make half as many engineers, half as many doctors half as many um architects half as many scientists half as many entrepreneurs that's not good that's not good for the world and africa needs you know foreign direct investment and they're not they're not expanding like crazy they're just limping into where we're going everyone's going down they just have a couple more years so it's not like they're they're going africa is going to be uh go from i don't know how many people are, are in africa now what's the population of africa two billion say africa's not going to go from two billion to eight billion it's going to go from two to two and a half maybe uh, how, the sterilization thing i don't know I don't know. They, they they could also, you know, one other thing is that there's going to be a lot of warfare. So as we deglobalize, people trust is going to break down. And one of the reasons why we're going to adopt Bitcoin as a global reserve currency and all that is because trust breaks down and Bitcoin embodies the trust. Just like gold, you don't have to, you know, in the old days, you didn't have to trust your neighbor king. You just transacted or you're not your neighbor king but you didn't have to trust the business partner in the other kingdom because you weren't using credit and stuff you were using gold the 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 money itself embodied the trust now you have to trust the banking system you have to trust the financial system you have to trust that they're not going to default what you know jim bob your partner is not going to default on you and all this stuff. So there, there's just too much trust that is required to keep this system going. And as we deglobalize, we'll have lower amounts of trust. And Bitcoin will solve that. But I was going to say something about, um, oh boy, I lost my train of thought. I've been going on now for over an hour, starting to lose my train of thought. So guys, let's see Bitcoin price. Ticking higher. We'll see if we get some action this weekend. Probably not. Maybe Sunday evening because, you know, that's when the CME futures open up Sunday evening. We could get a spike in price at that time, um, but probably pretty dead for the rest of the weekend. All right. So that's it, guys. Thanks for joining me, and I'll see you on the next one. Bye.